Welcome to my storage facility, or as my wife calls it, the living room. In efforts to keep it from becoming my bedroom, this week I experiment with new techniques by fixing past mistakes and making new ones. I had a ton of suggestions on what I should do to make these table bases work. From tension cables to support arms made from carbon fiber impregnated wood, but they all failed one test, and that's that they compromised the design. And in case you're new here, both of these bases came from a project earlier this year that didn't work out. So instead of reinforcing the bases, I'm going to attempt to make a lighter weight top. One to sell, one to give away. And if this doesn't work, we're gonna have a really big bonfire at the end of the video. The words lightweight and wood are typically not put together. So I was both excited for this challenge, but also I've been dreading it a little. Probably could have thrown some more steel in the bases to make them a little more rigid, but something about that just seemed like pushing my problem off on somebody else and not making me a better woodworker. So using what may very well be the last Baltic birch on the planet Earth, thanks a lot, Putin, I've decided to use a torsion box for the same reason that airplane wings are constructed using a torsion box. Strength, rigidity, weight. An old and wise, very old in fact, furniture maker and mentor of mine, Tim, sorry Tim, once told me execution should never inform design. The two must be separated and act independent of one another. That is to say, don't worry about how it's gonna come together, design it the way you wanna design it and figure the rest out later. Everything's possible. Basically present self telling future self to kick rocks. Oh, this design? Yeah. That's a problem for future me. I don't know how I'm gonna do it yet. This seems like a good time to mention that Tim is a former engineer. My whole life in construction is making a lot more sense now. I think this might take for granted a little bit our natural sense to intuit aesthetic and proportion design. But as a general rule of thumb, I think this separation of design and execution has served me pretty well. Until these tables anyway. Kind of a bummer I have to cover all this up because butter my butt and call me a waffle. That is just so tidy. As I mentioned, weight is the number one concern here, and I've saved a ton of it using quarter inch Baltic birch as the core. The second most important thing is, of course, the strength. By creating this grid, it not only tickles my OCD in all the right places, but we've got a ton of surface area that the skins or the top and the bottom will adhere to. The one issue this technique neglects is the attachment of the base to the top. So I've just taken a template of the base and the whole pattern that I have already established in that base to transfer over to the torsion box. And as you can see, I've labeled this template. So when Marie Kondo comes over, I can explain what each one of these templates I'll never use again does. support blocks will act as sort of bridges between the skins. Before assembling the torsion box, I need to get the skins veneered. I didn't set out with the goal of overcomplicating everything, but I want to get better at woodworking, and the only way I know how to do that is to do the next hardest thing every time. And that's worked pretty well for me until these tables. And that's where I failed. And then I failed not once, but twice. So the smaller of the two tables, the one we're working on now is using commercial veneer. Typically veneer comes in about 142nd inch. This on the other hand is a 16th inch. And I really like working with this because it's a uniform thickness and it cuts a ton of the labor out of the process. You'll see in a moment, we need to do this twice. For the larger table, I'll be doing something a little bit different, but for now, let's get all of these segments for the radial match sunburst veneer fit to one another and ready for veneering.
comes to fitment, I intentionally leave all of the segments just a little bit oversized. This allows me to trim just a little bit off of the hand plane of that last segment instead of having to come back through and fill, which is much more of a pain in the ass. Once the initial assembly is put together with blue tape, I come back with a little bit of veneer tape, which shrinks as it dries, pulling all those joints really tight together. And so that the edges don't break off, I've come through with a track saw and just nip those off. I've got a fancy veneer saw, but for this thick stuff, power tools definitely make life a little easier. Veneer glue differs from normal PVA in that it dries to a solid, rigid film, preventing what's known as glue creep. Before showing you my sack that we put veneer into, I usually wait till the end of the video, but because of you guys, I am practically a full-time YouTuber now and closing in on 100,000 subs. So if you think that I've earned it and you're not already, I'd really appreciate it if you considered subscribing. If you recall from a previous video, the smaller of these tables is actually going to one of you guys. So just stay tuned till the end to find out if that someone is you. The longer I practice this craft, the more finicky and fickle it seems every step along the way becomes. And as that standard for attention to detail rises, so too does stress. Hours spent awake in my bed at night wondering how I'm not going to mess up tomorrow. And from the outside looking in, I would understand if somebody wondered why one would put themselves through such torment. And I think a lot of it has to do with just how satisfying it is when it comes out right. A little vinegar in a squirt bottle cleans all of the epoxy right up off of the tools and we've got the large torsion box ready to go in the bag. While that dries, let's go ahead and get the small one together. Now that the torsion boxes are dry and the veneer is, well, veneered, it's time to begin to shape the round tops.
with the rough circles cut out of the torsion boxes. I use a router pivoted around the center to refine the shape. This establishes a reference point for the bearing on the router table to finish the job. The curved border of the table is by far the most stressful part of the entire process. I think sometimes learning looks like doing. And for this application, I have tried several different methods, but I've yet to work out a process that really knocks my socks off. Getting that inside radius perfect is so much harder than it seems like it should be on paper, but it's the closest part to the user. It's the part you're really gonna see and touch and feel and look at and appreciate. One saving grace is that this will have a inlaid black border to match the bases. Don't worry, you'll see those here in a minute. And it's one thing to get the radius right and make sure all of those angles are perfect. You can see I've cut the inside radius leaving the outside square. So if I need to adjust the angle between, I still have maintained a reference point. But then it's a whole other animal to clamp this border and make sure it's tight and gapless all the way around the table. Once I'm satisfied with the fit of the border, I can go ahead and take that outside edge off. In the past, I've left little ears to clamp the join together. I'll throw a link down in the description of the bistro table if you wanna see how that worked. This time around, I've opted for domino connectors. This seemed to work fine, except I don't know that there's enough clamping pressure to like really pull those in with the dominoes. So I might go back to the little ears, but this didn't not work. As always, a seamless fit requires just a little bit of finessing and to shape this inside curve, I've just used an offcut lined with a little bit of cork and some sandpaper. In order to match the bases, I'll be adding a small rabbit or shoulder all the way around the top here. A light scoring pass with a marking gauge prevents any tear out as the router plows its way through. And the final step before finish is that juice groove. It's actually a built-in gravy trough. Just a little black detail to tie the base visually into the top. Since smoke paint is particulate in nature, um, I've opted to use that so that it doesn't bleed into the end grain of the veneer. It's then followed by 
filling the rest of the trough with epoxy and sanding it flush. As always, rocking that Total Boat high performance. Total Boat, baby! And a steel wool vinegar solution is used to abonize the border. Well, shit. All right, well, now that I'm ready for finish, I have gone ahead and sanded through the veneer. I tried to fix it with a black ring. That made it worse. I think I've got an idea to fix this. So I think sometimes learning looks like doing, but occasionally it also looks like failing. And I think that's one of the things that's really drawn me to woodworking. If it's wood, there's almost nothing that's unfixable. At least that's what I thought. I gotta admit, I don't love showing my mistakes to hundreds of thousands of people, but I do know that you guys like to see them and I do appreciate the value in seeing how others tackle problems. Inlays in the center of radial match tables such as these, it's not uncommon. Uh, a lot of people can't get the points to gather to one single spot and you'll see a lot of these tables with inlays. If I had a CNC or Origin, I could have come up with some really cool inlay designs. Since all the lines in this inlay don't match up perfectly with the veneer in the top, I thought it'd be funny looking if I just tried to insert a replacement center. The veneer's already thin, so I'm not confident in doing the gravy boat again around the outside, just because I don't want to sand through epoxy and risk doing this again. But it's the center of the table, and I thought it might look cool to leave this just a touch proud. It's always going to have something centered in the table, and this almost gives it sort of a pedestal, bringing attention to the flaw, thus making it less noticeable. I wish I could give both of these tables away, but over the last 10 months, I've put literally hundreds of hours and thousands of dollars into this project, and I'm hoping it's not a complete loss. So the larger of the two tables will be listed auction style in the description below. I still don't think the pedestal table is probably the most stable design in the world. There's a little bit of flex still in the large one, but I'm pleased to report all of the jello problem is gone. And congratulations to Amanda Pyle, chosen at random. Text my Telegram account to claim your prize. Just kidding, I already got in touch with her. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks for the support and we'll catch you on the next one. Peace.